Hello, everyone, and welcome to Petite to Queen's Claim Your Career Crown podcast. I'm your host, Lynn, and today I'm joined by our VP of Operations, Amanda. Hey, everyone. And our very special guest, David Char. So, uh, for David, help, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. I, we are thrilled. And so for everyone who hasn't, doesn't know, David is an organizational psychology consultant. Okay, he's a keynote speaker, a trainer, and researcher specializing in building meaningful work while preventing burnout, which, I mean, man, how important is that? He helps businesses with their leadership and culture, a large part which regards diversity and inclusion. Today, we're going to be talking about how women face systematic challenges and how that's changing. Yay! <laughs> and what role women will uh, can and will play in their own professional futures. So David, we are so thrilled to have you um, here today and talking about this important topic. Thanks so much, Lynn, and thank you all out there. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, what a cool opportunity. Well, we are, this is such an important topic, and I know Amanda and I are thrilled to have this conversation. Uh, before we get started, for anyone who's joining us for the first time, uh, make sure you don't miss a single episode by subscribing to Claim Your Career Crown wherever you get your podcasts. And while we're on the topic, hey, click all five stars and share the love. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's get right into this. And I want to hear from you, David, what are the systematic challenges? I mean, I know from having worked in it uh, throughout my career and uh, climbing the corporate, corporate ladder, but I'd love to hear your perspective of what are the systematic challenges that women face in the workplace? Right. So unfortunately, there's not um, too much new that I can introduce in terms of what the challenges are to your audience, right? Um, they know because they, they live it, but especially right now during uh, this, this pandemic, uh, we're seeing a lot of these challenges um, become extremely exacerbated. So things like work-life balance um, it weighs much heavier on women than men because uh, despite it being 2021, um, women still take on the primary role at home and yet they're splitting the role in the workplace um, with their spouse, significant other, et cetera. Um, so women who are also mothers find it very challenging that work-life balance. Um, you've got issues in terms of the wage gap that continues to exist, um, a lack of representation in upper management, especially the C-suite, uh, which is incredibly impactful uh, because the issue isn't just that we don't have women there, but you, it, it, it affects you in the, in the sense that you don't see yourself in that role. And so they, it, it creates these limited beliefs. Um, there's this idea of stereotype that we're all familiar with, but there's also an idea of stereotype threat. One of my favorite examples of stereotype threat uh, is this experiment that was done many years ago uh, where they took women who were of Asian descent and they gave them a math test. But before they gave them the math test, they primed half of the women to um, think about being a woman, right? So they asked them a bunch of questions about co-ed dorms. This was a while ago, so that was the thing, right? And uh, where, you know, what do you think about co-ed dorms and things like that? They primed the other half of the women to think of their uh, Asian ancestry, right? And so they asked them about where did your grandparents come from? Do you speak, are you bilingual? Things like that. And then they gave them this math test. And what they found was that the women who were primed to, to think about their Asian heritage did better than average, better than the control group on the math test. And the women who were primed to think about being women before given the exact same math test did below average. Because we have primed ourselves to think that 
yeah, Asians are quote unquote supposed to be better in math and women are quote unquote supposed to stay away from STEM. And so thank God that's changing now, but it affects us. It doesn't, stereotypes don't just affect the way others view us, they affect the way we view ourselves. And so when we don't see that representation, that creates a really uh, challenging uh, experience for women in the workplace. Mm -hmm. That's true. I've heard yeah. about, I'm not sure about that specific test, but I've heard about similar tests where they um, test people on their math skills and they, they, they do something similar where they make the women think about being a woman and it makes them perform worse. And that's just so sad to me that uh, that um, that entire groups of people have been told like, oh, because you're this, you're going to be good at this or bad at that. And I think it's just, it's, it's so toxic and it, and it's amazing how much it actually affects us without necessarily realizing that it's affecting us too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely infects our mindset. And uh, I, I can see that, you know, from my perspective, but instead I had a different, I was sort of, I had that Kim Possible um, <laughs> sort of idea that I could be anything, I could do anything. And so for that, for my mindset, when I was, as I went through like high school and um, I would be in the STEM classes and I could tell as we got further and further along in math, you know, up to calculus, the, the amount of women in those classes definitely dropped out. And um, I was in, um, we had, we were lucky enough, we had like this engineering, um, pre-engineering program, you know, at my high school. And there were only two women, girls, you know, in that class. And uh, you would often get stuff like, well, you know, why are you even taking this? And it was like, yeah, it's fun. It's cool. I love it. And um, but you have to have that, um, like I said, that Kim Possible um, or the Captain Marvel, that mindset that, um, you know, I'm not going to be labeled, I'm going to be able to do this. But for so many of us, we are trained to be quiet, um, sit back in the, in the back seat and, you know, and, and be polite. And that type of socialization really hurts us at work. Yeah, my wife, my wife is a first grade teacher. She swears to this day that if it wasn't for a specific teacher in middle school or high school, maybe even elementary school, um, who I guess it was maybe middle or high school, um, who discouraged her from continuing on in the STEM classes, uh, she, she swears she'd be a doctor today. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's crazy. So... How does diversity and inclusion play a role in these challenges that we've been discussing? Yeah, so, you know, I think uh, as a society, we're getting much more aware of diversity for sure, mm -hmm. and much more sensitive to diversity. Um, there are enough of us talking heads going around telling everybody we need to diversify our workplace, right? And so, we're becoming more aware of diversity. I don't know fully. I don't know that we're fully thinking about diversity because when we think about diversity, we're thinking about your sex, your gender, your skin color. Um, and we're not thinking about the deeper levels of diversity, right? Diversity of thought. Um, and that feeds into this idea of inclusion, which very often gets dropped, right? So what we do is we open the doors for diverse individuals and we say, we need more women in here. We need more, um, you know, black and brown workers and we're not diverse enough and let's, right? And then, and then they bring people in and then those people don't feel like they have a home there. They don't feel like they have a voice there. They don't feel like they are valued there. So as the uh, people in the office might be coming more, uh, might become more diverse, the experience and the culture of the workplace remains stagnant. And so if you're a woman coming into, let's face it, many, many, if not most of, of these work cultures, these organizational cultures are masculine at their core. And so if you're a woman, you need to go closer to that side of it, right? So I'll come in and I will be more masculine. But what if you are more feminine, right? And what if you are, um, you know, a nurturer at heart and, and, this, and that's what you value and that's who you are. 
if it doesn't exist within the organization and your voice isn't valued, then you're not gonna you're not gonna continue at the organization. And if the organization isn't built, if our like business world had been built by women, you better believe we'd have better answers for maternity leave and work life balance and 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 uh you know the the work the work world would potentially be a softer place right in a in a lot of in a lot of ways and value different things but it's not and so we continue on that path so women are under the impression that if i'm a certain type of woman i can make it or i can fake being that type of woman but if i'm a different type of woman then it's just not made for me. And so they enter, they don't feel engaged, they don't feel valued, and what happens, they exit. Yeah, no, I think there's an, that point about diversity of thought, why it's so important in business is that you can bring in these alternate perspectives and points of views, people who look at things from a different angle. And when you do that, you get to see almost like a three-dimensional a uh, problem or issue or opportunity, but you get to see all the sides of it and that then you can actually create a stronger and better, you know, like whatever it is, product, service, you know, the outreach that you're going to do um, because you've seen those other sides and angles and you've thoroughly, you know, sort of considered and vetted them. And it can also really help you like with um, risk assessment. Because if you aren't bringing in those different thoughts um, and different perspectives, you can miss something because of your own blinders. And I think that's one of the most important reasons. And when you see companies that have really aggressively uh, pursued, you know, that that culture and of inc inclusive inclusive -city, I don't know. I can't even say the word. It's terrible. Um, yeah, but they've had so much more success. You know, and uh, you even look at uh, the few companies that are led by women, they perform better or women who are in really high level of management positions. And it is that transformational piece so that whether it's men or women, we can really and wherever we come from, if we have purple hair and tats or, you know, uh, you know, our skin is green. I mean, we've all come together and, you know, those different perspectives help us really uh, identify critical gaps that we wouldn't have seen without that input. Yeah, I, I was working with a law firm that had all of these opportunities for, they were, they were actively trying to get women up into their senior levels. And they were like, we opened it for them and, we, and we're encouraging them and we're mentoring them and we're doing all these things. And they just they just don't like continue on to that to that level and so we still don't look diverse you know despite us trying but the question is you're trying to make you know the what's the saying the square peg fit in the round hole right so you're you're trying to encourage up yeah it's going to be great it's going to be great but it's still a very specific um environment and yeah. if women are more prone to value that work-life balance, well, you know, senior senior leadership within a, a law firm within many businesses don't necessarily um, uh, implement a structure that that shows that they value that or or allows for that. Yeah. And so, no. Yeah. Right. And so so there's this model known as the ASA model, which is attraction, selection, attrition which means our businesses, and this is true about development as well, our businesses um, attract people that are similar to the people that are there. If you don't see yourself there, you're not even gonna apply, right? And then we select people who are similar to us. They, they have to be the right culture fit. And I think a lot of people get it wrong what that means. And then um, if they are selected, they somehow were attracted and they somehow were selected in, if there is still not quote unquote the right fit, they're gonna self-select out or be cut out, or they're just gonna be, you know, just they're just gonna exist instead of thrive within the organization. Yeah. I mean, all of that is 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 absolutely I, I mean, I, 
singing to the choir here. It's really <laughs> uh, great points and and law firms specifically because you know the they to get into those levels they're expecting you to work unbelievable hours um, where you basically have enough time to go home and sleep. I mean, uh, and that's so one way to break that is women have started their own law firms, you know, so that their law firms are structured differently. Um, and that's one reason why more women have started other types of businesses as well. So they can structure it. So you work a 40 hour work week and you get the rest of your life. <laughs> so, um, but let's sort of segue into the gender wage gap. And, um, you know, I know that there's been a lot of work to achieve pay equity, but, um, you know, there's a lot of different issues that we go that go into this and to fix this discrepancy. And, you know, with your point in STEM, those are much higher paying jobs. Um, my daughter is actually an aerospace research engineer. And um, as she went through her courses at college, she never really paid attention to it until I asked her as a senior that she realized that they had gone from parity about 50-50 when she started the program to about 20% of women graduating in that that area. And some of it was also even counselors. One of her friends, the counselor said, well, you should just change your major and just exit out of this. And mm -hmm. it was like so defeatist, right? Instead of how can we make this successful and how can you make this work? And, um, and even now, I mean, she works where there's not that many women, right? In these types of roles of doing, I mean, literally rocket research. And <laughs> so those are much higher paying jobs. A much higher paying jobs. And so that directly impacts um, discrepancy in wages. Women take time off for to have a child and take maternity leave. And they that literally that uh, in, impacts them every time they have a child because it pushes them down where, where men have continued to grow and to move forward. And also the perception of women when they have children um, is that, oh, you're leaving work early to go to daycare or something. Whereas if a guy is doing it, like to take his daughter to her softball practice, the perception is, oh, wow, what a great dad. Not mm -hmm. that you're slacking off on work. And that impacts women being able to rise in the corporate ladder. And then there is the situation where many companies, um, when you get your first offer, women don't negotiate. They don't try to get as much and they don't have parity. They don't have transparency. Um, I know that when uh, Obama had that initiative, all, like over 120 companies or something signed on to provide that transparency and to actually publish the, the wages for like positions. And it's down to like 16 companies that still do that every year and they publish and that they've created hard rules. If you, this is, you know, if you start at this position, this is the pay, you know, and this is the benefits because um, rather than letting men negotiate better and women take less, they take the first offer, they start at such a much lower level. And I feel like that type of transparency and um, from the businesses is so important because not just the big employers, but small employers so that everyone gets the same. I mean, and that um, for, you know, the position that they're in. Anyway, I'm sort of singing to the choir here. I, sorry, David, I, I stole your thunder, but what can we do differently to fix this discrepancy? I'm going to toss it to you. No, I think, I think you come up with so many great points and they all have such a, have such a huge impact, um, on that gender wage gap and it complicates things, right? Because we say, you know, when we're talking about about women don't negotiate well why is that my problem right the employer might say um but it's it get it's that it's it's what do we value as a society right why are teachers and nurses and social workers female dominated um uh, uh jobs valued by dollar so much less than STEM sort of jobs and 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 jobs where where it's much more um, uh, pop, there's there's a higher population of of men, so it, it's all of these things. And I think when you get down to what um, what role we can play in that and how we can fix that, we being women, sorry, I'm mansplaining here, but <laughs> but 
one of the one of the ways that we can that that women themselves can sort of uh, overcome this wage gap is what I, I you know a lot of people will say that that women and people from minority groups uh, suffer from imposter syndrome uh, yeah. more than men. I in my experience that's not true. I I have a um, uh, a friend who's a who's a judge about to hit retirement and. Uh, so peak of his career, about to hit retirement, and he has a recurring nightmare um, that uh, he's in the middle of court. Somebody comes busting through the door and says, hold everything. What your LSATs were actually switched with somebody else's, and you should have never been a lawyer, let alone a judge, and they drag him away, right? That's very much the imposter syndrome in a male judge at, at the pinnacle of his career. I think that men are better at faking it and better at pushing yeah. back at it. And they deal with their imposter syndrome in a different way. Yeah, they mask uh, so, it. Yeah, they right. mask it. Right, and so and so women won't, uh, won't exaggerate on their resumes, men do. Women won't lie on their resumes, men do. And I'm talking averages here, obviously. Um, and when it comes to the negotiation, women, will say whatever you think is fair, you know, or sold, and men will be like, I deserve more. I don't think the men actually think they do often, but I think that they're sort of primed to do that. Like that's sort of what you do. That's how you overcome imposter syndrome if you're a man, by completely denying it and, and being boastful. Whereas women deal with imposter syndrome in a very different way. So understanding that imposter syndrome is universal and not just among women um oh, i think yeah. is a really important piece it, it is it's so true i mean we actually have a course on overcoming imposter syndrome and uh, and it is i mean the research is that men and women experience this but they do it manifests differently or they um how they manage or or learn to overcome it is different and um and even for men, there's a side for them where if they're not tapping into that, you know, that emotional wealth that they have available to them, that women tend to do a better job at tapping into, that affects their health, it affects, you know, their relationships, it affects um, so many things in their the quality of their life um, that they're also being held back in a different type of way. Um, and I, I just, think that this is a really good point that you made. We also, I know that Amanda um, and has done research on that when women go into a field, start going into it heavily, like veterinarians, um, you saw the wages drop once, it, because now there's, you know, because of that parity. And then when you see men more aggressively go into nursing, you can see, you know, sort of the, it, you know, that, that boat floats up, you know, the, the tide rises. and mm -hmm. Um, it's definitely that, um, you know, that perception of the quality of work and also um, whether, and it's still just so predominantly gender based on the value of the work that's being delivered. Right. And, and sorry, go ahead, Amanda. Oh, yeah. I was just going to add on to what, what Lynn was saying about um, that research that we did for an article a while back. Um, it, 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 it proves that different jobs are not inherently valued more or less than other jobs. It's about who's doing the jobs and like seeing um, these different jobs that like this one that starts with more women, when more men go go to that job, it suddenly starts paying more and a different job that's paid well, when more women start going to that one, it starts paying less. And so it really does kind of drive home that point that these are not inherently valued jobs. It's about right. who's doing them. Yeah. Super, super interesting. And and even when we overcome our own imposter syndrome or, or as women learn to mask it, the issue is also, as Lynn pointed out earlier, when men and women uh, um, uh, you know, use the same sort of behaviors, exhibit the same sort of behaviors, they're seen differently. So mm -hmm. a man is seen as assertive, whereas a woman is seen as bitchy, if I can say that on here. Um, and and there is a very real discrepancy um, and a very a very clear reason why black women 
are are find themselves um, with more discrepancy here than 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 women in general, and typically are the ones who take the brunt of most of this, because for whatever reason there is this stigma of the angry black woman, and so when a black woman is assertive, they're punished by society for it, mm -hmm. and so. So it's not just about managing our own behaviors and our own thoughts, but it's it's working within the realm of of the other people's behavior or the other th people's thoughts and 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 um and trying to trying to manipulate the situation where you can get ahead without triggering these things. But is that fair to ask of anybody? First of all, and second of all then you're not being authentic. And now we're back to the inclusion piece, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, it is. So it, right, so it has, to be, it has to be systemic change, but it happens drip by drip by people, by people saying, no, this isn't normal. No, we need a change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there, there is definitely a, a double-edged sword um, for women in, in the workplace, and especially as you move into leadership roles. Um, and, you know, and, um, I, I have, I believe I have an article, of Amanda, just so much, so much content, so little time, um, specifically about that and some um, ways that you can, um, you know, apply certain techniques so that you aren't giving up your genuine, authentic self, but at the same time, um, you are, uh, you know, really standing in your own power, and that's important. And of course, I don't have that experience of, of course, of being a black woman. But yeah, I mean, it's like, I don't know if it's tenfold or a hundredfold, but that walking that line um, is just painful. I mean, it's painful. And the darker your skin, I think that's, it just exponentially goes up. Um, and that's just, obviously it's so wrong <laughs> on every level. So, wow. Right. And, <laughs> and I would say that for um, people on the other end, the people who are hiring, who are making the promotion decisions, the right answer here is to pull away from the emotional decision making. So often, you know, one of the most popular uh, methods, maybe the most popular method for hiring, right, for, for selecting new employees or for selecting people for promotion is sort of this unstructured interview, right? So we sit down with somebody and we, it's a get to know you and every employer or manager or senior leader that I've ever worked with has ex has described themselves to me as a really good people person or a really good judge of character, every single one. So, and they might all be right. But what I tell them is that besides my wife, who we've been married 14 years going strong, you know, every other root friend that became a roommate in my life, we're not really friends anymore. Why? Because I'm a great judge of character. I knew we got along. It's, you know, it's great. We already have this pre-existing relationship. What does that have to do with inviting somebody to move in with you, right? What you need to be thinking about and asking when you're selecting a roommate is, do you party late at night? Do you pay your bills on time? Do you wash the dishes after you? Those are relevant. And so yeah. when we go from an unstructured interview and we go to a structured interview where we're actually looking at job competencies, the knowledge, skills, and abilities that are that actually make the difference between somebody doing being a poor performer or an excellent performer within that role. And we and we structure our questions directly from there and we stick to the script and we use, you know, personality assessments and whatever other tools, inboxes, and it, we use all of that. And uh, as a way of selecting the right people, now we're being more analytical about the thoughts, about, about our choice, right? And we're, and we're asking everybody the same series of questions and everybody's going through the same things. It makes it a lot easier to select fairly and look beyond what your gut instinct might tell you about the tone of that person's voice when they answered that question. Whereas if it's a man, you might say assertive, and if it's a woman, you might judge it differently. Yeah, well, your own prejudices are gonna be influencing um, how you're, because you are judging them, even if you're, if it's subconscious, 
Mm-hmm. And that is so true. And I, that's what I was listening to that. And I'm going like, you know, I never have considered myself a great judge, a character or a, a people person. And yet, you know, I, I really, I get on well, but I work to build that rapport. And I always go into uh, like new relationships. It's funny, but I go into them very reserved and I, you know, want to see how it plays out. Right. Uh, because um, I guess being in professional sales all my, you know, for most of my career, I would see people who could do that. And it sounded like they're just incredible and wonderful. But then you would see after the second and third and fourth and, you know, so meeting like, okay, that, that, that's just this, this, it's like a shield or it's like um, a magic mirror. And what's behind that mirror is really quite different. Um, And to your point, those types of questions. And I think sometimes also asking people questions that are really different that causes them to either you want to see do they act offensively do they get aggressive do they get um or do they pause and consider and then come up with a response um and that type of thing can sort of help you figure out well how would they react or respond um when things go sideways or when there's a specific challenging point um that that the you know the team or the company's trying to work out Right. And being able to draw that direct line to what it is that you need in that role um, to fit the culture. But when we talk about a fit in culture, we're talking about a lot of diversity fitting within one culture. We can we can have diversity of thought, diversity of skin color, diversity of sex and gender. We can have all sorts of diversity that agree on on the core values of the company, et cetera. Um, and and so we can create a culture that is actually diverse and is always having like like a pull at each other and and sort of sort of um, disagreement like healthy disagreement yeah. and sort of sort of fighting it out to to come up with the best answers. Um, I think it's it's so important, but uh, but we need to tie the interview into what we're looking for uh, within that within that culture. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So we've been talking about um, some changes already, but how else do you think things are changing for the better? And moreover, what can we do to stay on this path and even accelerate it? Yeah, so it looked like things have been changing for the better until COVID hit. And now you've got, uh, I saw I saw a number recently, um, uh, one of the big consulting firms, I forget which one, um, said, found that like 20 to 25% of mothers are looking to leave the workforce now because since COVID hit, that's a scary number, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Because people have gone home and now when they go home, whose responsibility is it to do the juggling if you're parents, right? Um, And unfortunately, uh, we're still in a space where so much of that, uh, an overwhelming amount falls on, um, on the woman, the mother, and and that's that's a real issue. So I think we're taking a little bit of a step back now, but I think generally things are changing, and they're because of people like you, like this this organization right here, um, women talking to women. And that's why my daughter said before I came on here, she said, "Daddy, you're talking to women about being women, but you're a man." <laughs> and I said, "I know, honey. There's a word for that. It's called mansplaining. I'll apologize to the audience, but but." Really, it's important for for um, women to to get together and be a voice for and with other women. Uh, ERGs, employee resource groups, are are extremely valuable. Where where um, you can create these these uh, subcultures, these groups um, to talk about unique challenges amongst people who are similar to you. Um, we we have all of these different opportunities right now, and and they are being sort of sort of uh, um, uh, put in place in 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 a lot of instances. Uh, but we've got we've got a lot of opportunity ahead of us. Uh, once the C-suite starts changing over, and that's gonna yeah. take time. But once that starts changing over, and we have you know more than more than 25% of, a, of the C-suite, much closer to 50% of the C- C-suite being women or at the rate that women are graduating from everything except STEM programs right now, right? I mean, they're beating out men at every single level. Uh, pretty soon it's gonna be over 50% uh, 
uh, women in the C-suite, I believe, but um, we need to get there. And it's, it's not an easy battle, but it's one that is being fought on so many levels. And I think that having that support, um, there was one study that found that women who had, women should find a male and a female mentor. Because unfortunately, the truth of the matter right now is in most organizations, the, the male mentor is gonna be closer to the power core, right? And so they can open doors for you. The female mentor is living your experience, a, a closer experience to your experience and will have a better perspective on that. So they tell you to, to, to seek out both a male and a female mentor. Um, there, yeah. There's so many things that are being done right now to get us closer to the goal. And that's so true. I mean, I, I had, a, I was so lucky to have some amazing, amazing male mentors. Um, at, at, but I did end up having a female mentor and that was really helpful because she was in a male dominated industry like I was and having some like that who could um, sort of listen to something and then bounce back, um, you know, her perspective and an idea that would help me look at something completely differently. But I will say that my male mentors were incredible. All of them had smart, capable, well-educated daughters. I think that made a difference, you know, because they were looking for their daughters, you know, um, to, uh, you know, have their impact on the world. And they, honestly, I they did not treat me differently uh, because I was a woman and in fact, because of that, I was they they I was promoted over and over until I did you know reach the sweet sweet you know and I, that was um, so impactful to ha and also to have that different perspective because from a gender pers gender viewpoint um, and I know that as a woman I adopted a lot of male colloquialisms um, in my conversation you know like we got to get this over the the yard you know the the you know, the yard line, I mean, we got to score a touchdown, we got to, you know, this is going to be a Hail Mary, you know, whatever. I used a lot of sports type colloquialisms, mm -hmm. but with a big male audience, they all got it, you know, and I still, to this day, use all those because that's just sort of my world I lived in, and it was a way um, to get a point across that immediately clicked, you know, mm -hmm. like, this is the situation we're in, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, um, what do you think that individual female employees can do to ensure their success in the workplace? And on a related note, how much power do they have over their own careers, despite these challenges that we've discussed? Yeah. So, I think I think we spoke to this, but I think definitely finding those two those two mentors uh, is a great idea. Tapping in to resources. Um, as you see them popping up everywhere that that there are women seeking to help other women navigate um, uh, the working world. I think that that is it is essential. Um, having being able to see women who are doing great things in in the workplace, um, you know, having those mentors. Uh, those those sort of people that you look up to and 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 uh, aspire to be like, um, and and if ideally can even pick their brain on on different you know uh, issues uh, that that pop up along the way. I think that that is absolutely essential. Uh, it's not all that needs to be done, but um, and it's not going to be easy because there is the systemic stuff that's pushing back on you. Uh, but I think that any individual person can be extremely successful despite all of that. Um, and as a group, we all need to be looking out for um, women, uh, black and brown people, um, indigenous people, people who are um, not fully represented within the workplace. We need to be looking out for them. Uh, and and be a resource for them um, wherever we can, because uh, the allyship is extremely important, especially um, for any men who might be listening to this. Uh, you are in this position where your voice might be heard differently than a woman's voice. And whenever you can 
uh, stand up and speak for somebody else um, that that adds a lot of power to the situation. Right. Yeah, definitely. We should all be fighting for our own, you know, our, our own rights, and our own advancements. But I think it's also important to be allies to other groups too, and to mm -hmm. lift up others when you have that power to do so. Yeah, and, and you can do that by also giving them voice. I know that one of the things that I would do in my team meetings, you know, in my corporate world, and I still do it now in our smaller group, um, but I want to make sure that everybody has had a chance to voice their opinion or get their input. And if, uh, and I have certain team members who will be quiet, and then I will ask them specifically, so what are your thoughts? Um, and by drawing them out, then they, they get to share their thought and their input, and then also by creating opportunities for them uh, to to do the, the presentations, to figure out what's the strategy, what's the plan, and for them to you know, have those positions of literally of, of power in a way, they're, this world that they're in control of. That's another thing that's really important. And then that helps others in the group perceive them differently, that they're a leader in this area. Uh, that they're, uh, and so that, that can be a way that we can really um, help one another. And for the men out there, that's a great way to make sure that you know everyone in the group, and that you're you're, um, and then you can also do side sidecar discussions with them about how you can bring that up, and then say, okay, they had, you know, Amanda had this great idea and suggestion, um, so that way you're already validating it, and say, Amanda, will you share this with the team? And so yeah. that's another way to let give them that you know th that attitudinal shift, right? Yeah, there's a. Uh... In my master's program, I was with um, a um, a woman. She was she was a, a black woman, and you know we're all the heroes of our own story, and we're all perfect in our own mind. And so I, you know, I my voice always need to be heard. I'm a professional speaker for God's sake. I always need to be heard, right? Everybody needs to hear my message. So uh, we. Uh, this individual and I worked in a lot of groups together, and it was the first time that I was brought to attention about something about myself, especially in a diverse group, unfortunately, that every time there was a question or something to speak on, I immediately started speaking. Mm -hmm. And that this individual, Joe, she, she would continuously, anytime, it was almost like slapping my hand, she'd say, excuse me, I was speaking, or excuse me, I have a thought, you know, and just sort of like, super assertive and at first when somebody does that to you when somebody is assertive toward you or correcting you or or putting it out there in the world that maybe you're not you don't have this 100 percent figured out maybe you're not 100 percent perfect you know it, it your first instinct is to be defensive like oh okay you know but being open to that and understanding our own blind spots is extremely important in how we change and grow as individuals and as a society and so that experience has stuck with me for forever, where I'm much more conscious uh, about being in a room and specifically being in a diverse room and understanding the people who um, were not raised to understand that their voice was super important and to give them that opportunity. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that is, that's what uh, really, when you find a mentor, you want a mentor who is going to give you constructive criticism that's going to help you stretch your boundaries uh, and and grow um, both personally and professionally uh, obviously I mean if you're working with a professional uh, a mentor on that professional career level um, but there's also things that it can help you to uh, in your personal life to be honest um, but mm -hmm. that's so important if you get a mentor who's only going to agree with you and be a cheerleader and never do the other side the real work happens when people um, are pushing you to stretch a little, yes. uh, to look at things differently, to consider something from an alternate perspective. Um, and, you know, so that sort of segues right here. So we're talking about finding mentors um, and um, how that's going to affect your career. So if we're looking into the future, we have our crystal ball. Um, uh, David, how do you envision workplaces? Um, what should they look like as we move forward? And what's our path to get there? And you know what's what are going to be the obstacles that we need to either go through, over, around, or, or tunnel under? Yeah, I think I hope 
uh, that organizations are going to continue to become more and more diverse and that the conversation is going to continue to shift from diversity to inclusion. Uh, and you see this in so many facets. People are talking about neurodiversity now, you know, wait, wait, because somebody is, uh, you know, ADHD, we write them off as totally not conscientious. This person's not gonna do anything right. And it's like, no, maybe they're extremely creative and, and they have the energy and the passion, right? I'm guilty of having ADHD. And then, and then, um, you know, uh, people, people on the autism spectrum, we just write them off like uh, mental disability, but, and it's like, what? No, their brain works in a different way. And that type of diversity is extremely valuable. And so diversity at every level and like needs to be embraced but even more so the conversation needs to move from diversity to inclusion, where it's not just checking boxes, trying to yeah. stay out of court and trying to stay in the good graces of public opinion, that it is what are we actually doing with that diversity? How are we valuing these people? Do we understand the assets that are within our organization and are we making the most of it or do people not even feel valued or safe enough to speak? Uh, so I think as long as we keep going down that path and closer to that that talk on in, uh, inclusion and equity and all of the other things that we need to do in order to make things uh, work better for us selfishly, it works better for us as the yeah. organization. Yeah. And it also works better for society and for the individuals. And I think if we continue to do that, uh, we'll continue to make progress. I feel very positive about about what we're seeing in terms of the growth, and I hope it's exponential growth because if we keep growing at this, at the same pace, that's not something to be super excited about. But I hope it's exponential growth, and that, and that as we continue to grow toward more diversity, in equity, and inclusion, that um, that th that growth rate is going to speed up as well. Yeah. Wow. All right. <laughs> What a what a what wonderful way to wrap up our conversation, uh, and this has been. An amazing discussion, uh, and David, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on how women can push uh, their organizations toward greater diversity and inclusion. Uh, and I know our listeners are gonna wanna know where and how they can find out more about you. Sure, so they can visit my website. That's a very impersonal way to do it, illuminatepmc.com. Don't recommend that path. What I do recommend uh, if you want information, it's great. But what I do recommend is reaching out to me on LinkedIn, um, uh, linkedin.com slash IN slash David Shar. Pretty easy to get there. You can just search my name, David Shar, um, and continue the conversation. I'd love to hear, um, you know, as, as a white man getting up and talking about diverse experiences within the workplace to an audience of women, um, it's, in my best interest to know what what the audience is actually thinking and i'd love for people to reach out if they want to pick my brain but also if they want to teach me something i'd love to talk as well david thank you thank you so much um and amanda uh for this really incredible discussion today um i'm, I'm so grateful that we had this chance to really go into this important topic thank and you Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no, go ahead. Thank you. This is this has been a really great experience, and uh, um, I, I'm very grateful that you invited me on here, and for all of your listeners who have stuck around to listen to me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and so for all of you out there who are tuning in, if you have thoughts that you would like to share, you can leave us a comment in the comment section. We do love to hear your thoughts. And if you have a question or would like to suggest topics for discussion, you can email us at join the conversation at petite to and to stay current on all of our insightful advice. Um, a lot of things we referenced during this show, we'll try to link those um, in the post below, um, but also our breakthrough advantages and those conversations of women to women and how to succeed in the workplace. Uh, please sign up for our weekly wisdoms newsletter at petite to and you won't miss out on any of that wonderful, wonderful, great content. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, David. Thank you, Amanda, um, and everyone who tuned in.